Good morning, everyone. This joint hearing of the Subcommittee on Research and the Subcommittee on Technology will come to order. Good morning. Welcome to today's joint hearing entitled Federal Efforts to Reduce the Impacts of Windstorms. In front of you are packets containing the written testimony, biographies, and truth and testimony disclosures for today's witnesses. Before we get started, since this is a joint hearing involving two subcommittees, I want to explain how we will operate procedurally so all members understand how the question and answer session period will be handled. The chairman and ranking members of the research and technology subcommittees will be recognized first. Then we will recognize members of the two subcommittees present at the gavel in order of seniority on the full committee, and those coming in after the gavel will be recognized in order of arrival. I now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Today's hearing will focus on how we can reduce the impacts of debilitating storms on our communities across the country. Even with improved forecasting capabilities and awareness, these storms can be unexpected and leave a trail of destruction in their paths. In addition to literally destroying lives, these windstorms shut down entire economies of a region during the time it takes to rebuild. Structures, while more resilient than they used to be, are still often not built to sustain high winds or storm damage that may follow these storms. Building codes, practices, and performance standards can help. But oftentimes, retrofitting an existing building is simply too costly given the relatively small risk of a direct hit of a windstorm. Federal agencies currently conduct research and development to help inform the resilience of buildings and communities, but it is not clear how each agency is conducting unique work that is not duplicated by another agency. I believe that a co coordinated mechanism would help shed light into what is going on at the federal level and how, we can and, and how it can be strengthened to ensure better coordination. Every year, the federal government funds not only disaster relief, but also billions of dollars in emergency supplemental appropriations when states are hit particularly hard by unexpected disasters. I believe that we need to be more responsible about planning how to deal with natural disasters. I'm curious to hear from our witnesses if they believe better research could cut down on the dollar figure. Since the the time that my colleague, Rep Representative Nugabauer, introduced his windstorm research bill in late April, several, several Midwestern states have endured significant damage and loss of lives from powerful tornadoes. I would now like to yield to Representative Nugabauer for him to share some background on that legislation. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate you holding this important hearing today. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we know about wind, and particularly uh, in West Texas where I'm from, uh, wind can be your friend uh, or it can be your foe. And uh, out in West Texas right now, my congressional district, for example, probably has the largest concentration of uh, wind production for electricity uh, really in the world. And so it's, that's a time when it's our friend. But then where it can be our foe is obviously when we've seen uh, these deadly tornadoes that uh, have occurred uh, in uh, Texas and Oklahoma and other states recently. And, and over the, the history, uh, we've seen uh, where hurricanes and, and windstorms and uh, tornadoes have caused a tremendous amount of property damage, but more importantly, uh, it's caused the loss of lives. I think it's estimated that uh, every year there's about 80 deaths uh, and 1,500 injuries. Uh, I think in 2011 there was 50, 551 fatalities. Uh, that was not particularly a good year, and I th unfortunately we're, we're kind of off to a rough start uh, this year. Uh, and so what makes sense is to take uh, research and technology uh, and uh, figure out ways that uh, in, to incorporate into our construction techniques a way to protect uh, both the, the people uh, that habitat, uh, habitate those facilities, but also to protect uh, and mitigate the damage. As the chairman mentioned, uh, you know, it causes billions uh, of dollars uh, worth of damage. Uh, and if we can mitigate that, uh, it obviously uh, saves uh, that money for not only the taxpayers, but for the people that, that own those properties. And I'm particularly uh, uh, delighted at the extreme uh, great panel that we have today. Uh, and uh, particularly uh, my good friend for a long time, uh, Texas Tech, Dr. Kiesling, uh, and for his pioneering work on, you know, the mitigation of wind. And so with that, there's reason that I introduced uh, in 2004 the National Windstorm Impact Reduction Act. 
but basically to try to coordinate all of the act uh, the research that's going on uh, and then make sure that one of the things that I feel very strongly about is is that it's one thing to do the research but then we have to commercialize and use that uh, research and I think one of the things that we've seen uh, is a lot of the research that have been done uh, across the country has been able to be uh, commercialized now I'm hopeful to hear more about that today but in warp uh, basically does another thing too that I, I think is important and that is to make sure that we're efficiently using the taxpayers' money, uh, coordinating this. So many times we've seen in all agencies, everybody kind of has their turf. And, and since the, the wind issue has a lot of different parts to it, uh, it makes sense to make sure that there's coordination going on uh, among the various uh, uh, participants uh, that are uh, involved in that. And so uh, this, uh, this bill, I think, is going to help protect uh, lives. I think it's going to reduce property losses. But more importantly, it also makes sure that there's good coordination uh, so that uh, when we do come up with good ideas, that we can make sure that we commercialize them and that we can utilize that information in the future. And so, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much uh, for uh, having this important hearing, and I look forward to hearing from these uh, witnesses. Thank you. We have a panel of witnesses before us who can articulate what it will take to cut down on the economic impact and lives lost from these storms. I would like to extend my appreciation to each of the witnesses for taking the time and effort to appear before us today. We look forward to your testimony. I now recognize Ms. Wilson for her opening statement. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman Bouchon and Chairman Massey for holding today's hearing on the National Windstorm Impact Reduction Program, or NWERP. I'd also like to recognize our ranking member from the entire committee, uh, committee Ms. Johnson, to our committee meeting today. NWERP directs four federal agencies, FEMA, NOAA, NSF, and NIST, to conduct coordinated research and development on the nature of wind storms, their effects, and on ways to mitigate their impact. The program also calls on these agencies to make sure this research is translated into practice. This work has led to advances in monitoring the design and construction of buildings and increased awareness and preparation by the public. But there is still much more to be done. Regrettably, consideration of this program is timely as our thoughts and prayers go out to the people of Moore, Oklahoma, who are putting the pieces back together after a massive tornado ripped through their community just two weeks ago. As a Floridian and survivor of Hurricane Andrew, I know firsthand that natural hazards are a leading threat to Americans' economy and Americans' lives. In recent years, Americans have seen flooded subway stations in New York City, earthquake damage in the nation's capital, the great American city of New Orleans submerged underwater, unimaginable devastation in Joplin, Missouri, and new, now entire neighborhoods in Oklahoma flattened to the ground. There has, in fact, been a record number of declared fatal disasters in the United States over the last two years, and 2011 was the deadliest year on record for tornadoes with over 550 fatalities. While we cannot stop a hurricane or tornado from happening, we should do all that we can to make sure our communities have the tools they need to respond and recover from such an event. We as a nation must invest in preparedness and resilience. Studies of FEMA's pre-disaster mitigation program have shown that for every dollar we invest in mitigation activities, we save three to four dollars in recovery costs. NWERP has the potential of, to dramatically bolster the res resiliency of our communities and reduce the cost associated with disaster recovery. Unfortunately, experts have expressed concern that insufficient funding has negatively impacted the implementation of the program, and we are missing out on low-cost mitigation opportunities. Because of this, I do have some concerns with the legislation we are considering today. First, the bill cuts the authorization level for the program by 14 percent. Second, it locks in this lower funding level for the duration of the bill. We don't have any reason to believe the agencies need any less money to carry out the responsibilities we assigned them the last time we authorized this program. And when we consider the devastating losses that have plagued the United States recently, this cost, course of action seems irresponsible. That is why I introduced 
the bipartisan version of the Natural Hazards Risk Reduction Act, which will provide the program with an authorization level more appropriate to the task. This legislation passed the House by an overwhelming margin in the 111th Congress and also reauthorizes the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program. While there are differences between hazards, there are also commonalities and occasions where we should leverage resources. This committee has an important role to play in helping Americans prepare for and recover from all natural hazards. By, reauthorization, by reauthorizing both of these programs, we can minimize the number of Americans who are harmed or killed by natural disasters or who have to face the challenges of putting their homes, businesses, and communities back together. I look forward to working with my colleagues to make our communities more disaster resilient. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Uh, the Chair now recognizes the Ranking Member of the Full Committee, Ms. Johnson, for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Chairman Bichon, for holding today's hearing uh, to examine the National Windstorm Impact Reduction Program. The last few years have been devastating years for natural disasters in this country. We experienced the deadliest and most destructive tornado season in U.S. history in 2011. Unfortunately, the trend continues this year with massive tornadoes in Oklahoma and in my home state of Texas. We've also had earthquakes in areas that don't usually experience earthquakes, including Virginia and again Oklahoma. And Hurricane Sandy and Irene caused widespread destruction and death along the eastern seaboard. This committee has an important role to play in minimizing the number of Americans who are harmed or killed by natural disasters or who have to face the challenge of rebuilding their homes, businesses, and communities. By reauthorizing the National Windstorm Impact Reduction Program, we can reduce the vulnerability of our communities to disasters. Therefore, I'm glad my fellow Texan, Congressman Nagababa, has been a champion and in work, and that he has introduced legislation to reauthorize this important program. However, I want to express my support for the legislation recently introduced by Congresswoman Wilson, of which I'm co-sponsor. The National Hazards Risk Reduction Act of 2013 would reauthorize both the wind-related program and the National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program. I believe we need to take a multi-hazardous approach to disaster mitigation, and Ms. Wilson's legislation would link these two critical programs through the establishment of a single interagency coordinating committee, creating opportunities for synergy among the various research activities. I also don't believe we should prioritize one hazard program over another, as they are all important to the producing communities that are resilient to any and all disasters. As a result, I hope that as we move forward with the legislation, we consider all of the hazards program within the committee's jurisdiction. And finally, it is clear that in work, our agencies have not gotten the resources they need to carry out all of the responsibilities assigned to them by the Congress. Thus, I'm concerned by the cuts proposed in the legislation that is the topic of today's hearing. We simply can't afford to have these agencies miss opportunities to implement low-cost mitigation measures. In the end, strong and effective hazard reduction programs will not only save lives and property, but also provide us with meaningful cost savings. Thank you, Chairman Bouchard, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. Now I'd like to introduce the witnesses. Our first witness is Dr. Ernest Kiesling, a professor of civil engineering at Texas Tech University and executive director of the National Storm Shelter Association. He has had a long career with Texas Tech University serving as chairman of the civil engineering department and as an associate dean of, the engineer, of engineering for research. He leads the storm shelter research effort within the wind science and engineering research center at Texas Tech. Dr. Kiesling received his MS in mechanical engineering from 
Texas Technological College and an MS and PhD in Applied Mathematics from Michigan State University. Welcome. Our second witness is Deborah uh, Balin. Did I pronounce that right? Balin. Balin, the General Counsel and Senior Vice President for Public Policy for the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. Ms. Balin has also worked with the American Insurance Association and the University of Colorado's Advisory Committee for the Hazard Center. She graduated with a JD from Harvard Law and an AB degree from Princeton University. Thank you. Our final witness is Dr. David uh, Previtt, an assistant professor at the University of Florida. He has been with the University of Florida's Department of Civil and Coastal Engineering since 2007. His research focuses on the mitigation of extreme wind, wind damage to low-rise construction. Dr. Previtt is a member of the American Society of Civil Engineers on the board of the American Association for Wind Engineering and a member of the UK Wind Engineering Society. Dr. Previtt received his PhD from Clemson University. Welcome. As our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limit, limited to five minutes each, after which members of the committee have five minutes each to ask questions. Your written testimony will be included in the record of the hearing. I now recognize our first witness, Dr. Kiesling, for five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Bouchon, Mr. Lagerbauer, distinguished committee members, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. You've done a good job of outlining both the problem and potential solutions and pointed to one of the major problems that we face in not only lack of funding but lack of continuity in funding to, uh, to do the research we need to do. One other thing I'd point out is not just the loss of lives and the human suffering, but the anxiety that comes with, uh, with uh, severe events like tornadoes and hurricanes. And I will speak primarily on st storm shelters or safe rooms because that's where I've spent most of my career working. And secondly, I, I think it, it addresses this last problem of anxiety and human suffering uh, <clears throat> effectively. I have been part of the uh, wind engineering program at Texas Tech since 1970 uh, when a F5 tornado impacted Lubbock. I was chairman of the civil engineering department at that time. Uh, you can help make my day by telling me I don't look old enough to have done that, but uh, I don't want you to lie. <laughs> With your support, we've developed a world-class program at, at Texas Tech, uh, <clears throat> unparalleled facilities that I have included a picture of some of in the uh, report, uh, a unique doctoral program in wind science and engineering, and we've turned out about 20 doctor, doctoral students or graduates there, and they're taking prominent places in uh, the professional community. Uh, and today we, we have very good weather forecasting that gives information on locations and paths of tornadoes and hurricanes, but we still have to deal with the, the effects of severe winds. And even the ad advice given the public we found in the last two weeks in Oklahoma uh, leaves much to be desired. In fact, it's, uh, it's uh, <clears throat> inaccurate and dangerous uh, some of the advice that's being given so not only do we uh, need to do the good work such as forecasting has done but need to convey a consistent message to the public as to how do you react and how do you respond uh, to disasters a focused approach to research and development and implementation is needed to reduce impact to wind storms on urban society uh, many specific areas could be mentioned, testing facilities, a repository for windstorm damage documentation, and that's in progress, uh, development of computational wind engineering tools, uh, implementation of known research into standards and codes, and others will speak to that, uh, development of manpower to uh, pursue meaningful research and, and professional practice. Uh, and then educational programs that convey sound, consistent guidance to the people 
uh, as to how they re react and, re and respond to extreme events, extreme wind events. Uh, property damage can surely be ab abated by improved building codes and by their enforcement. We have a tremendous problem in lack of enforcement because that's done largely at the local level. And uh, there are many disconnects that occur between the uh, agencies that and the researchers that generate good research and what happens in the field. And we education, I think, is the best way to address that. We have, particularly in the storm shelter area, uh, available standards and guidelines. We have an industry association, the National Storm Shelter Association. We have a SEAL program that recognizes those storm shelters that, that comply with the standards. Uh, we have all types of shelters available today that meet these standards and guidelines and provide near absolute occupant protection from extreme winds. Yes, even an EF5, despite some of the information that has been given, uh, particularly in the last couple of weeks in Oklahoma. Some of the advice given has been deadly and wrong. Uh, there are many characteristics of the hazard mitigation grant program, and, and uh, Ms. Johnson, you mentioned that it's an excellent program that does a lot of good things. The downside of it is that the funding that's generated uh, is post-disaster. So it sometimes is four or five years. We're just now finishing some projects that were funded with the uh, hazard mitigation program with funding going out of Hurricane Ike that occurred five years ago. So it takes time, and I, I think it's important that we have, say, pre-disaster mitigation grants of some type and sizable ones that can, can do preparation for disasters, not respond to them. Uh, I don't understand why the pre-disaster mitigation grant program was discontinued. And I'm not saying that we need that, but we need something like that that allows us to prepare in advance. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about shelters being mandatory. Uh, I believe that, uh, that the uh, states, such as Alabama, has set a good example, and that storm shelters for schools should be made mandatory by states that have the serious problem uh, in new buildings, and much can be done to uh, improve existing buildings in that regard. I believe that mandatory laws should also, or shelters should also be for uh, multifamily residential housing units, vulnerable populations such as daycare uh, centers, um, uh, retirement villages, and so forth, uh, nursing homes, mobile home parks, and apartments. I think it should not be mandatory for privately owned single family and multifamily residences, though incentives of some type would certainly be appropriate. So my recommended action would simply be that uh, you've identified the agencies, the NIST, FEMA, NOAA, NSF, all are experienced in administering large scale programs and they work well together, I think. Uh, we have capable professional personnel that conduct research if they have adequate funding to do so. And I think if you look at the, particularly at the, uh, uh, say, the uh, programs that have been funded, the earthquake program and the uh, prediction program uh, in, in the weather area, you will uh, see that we have unprecedented return on investment in those programs. And I would encourage Congress to uh, make funding available f to make similar investments in the area of mitigating the wind disaster. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize our second witness, uh, Ms. Ms. Ballin, for five minutes. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Deborah Ballin. I am with the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, a 501c3 organization wholly supported by the property insurance and reinsurance industries and dedicated to mitigation research and communications. As a research organization focusing on mitigation, IBHS has long been supportive of the NWRP. We provided testimony during hearings that led to its initial authorization, as well as the effort to reauthorize the program in 2008, and we have worked in partnership on a number of projects 
with all of the NWERP agencies. We are pleased to be here today and we thank you for your interest in this important matter. Given the broad geographic threat of windstorms, the percentage of our population at risk, the frequency of events and the tremendous toll taken, the federal investment in wind-related research is much less than it should be. That said, we are not negative on a multi-hazard approach. A coordinated, well-funded research program as embodied in NWERP is needed to pull together scientific information about wind hazards, wind engineering expertise that defines the connection between storm characteristics and loads imposed on buildings, structural engineering expertise that develops efficient systems to handle these loads in new and existing buildings, and national coordinated efforts to promote mitigation. We believe that IBHS can play an important role in these initiatives. The centerpiece of our research program is our unique world-class research center. Using a 105 fan array to simulate wind, as well as full-size residential and commercial test specimens and other specialized equipment, IBHS can recreate a variety of highly realistic natural disasters involving wind alone, wind plus rain, wind plus fire, and wind plus hail. I would like to take a moment to show you how research and related communications contribute to our understanding of the destructive power of wind and the benefits of mitigation. You will see the power of wind in a video from the first public demonstration that we conducted at the Research Center in the fall of 2010. We subjected two wood frame houses to a highly realistic storm, as has occurred in North Texas and the Midwest. Although they look the same from the outside, the home on the left was built using a code as it exists in central Illinois, while the home on the right was built to a higher IBH standard. I should add that the winds you are going to see were not tornadic. So here is a very short video of that test. You can see just how quickly and how completely the home on the left was destroyed. And as you think about the loss of life and property, had this been a real event with people inside the home that was destroyed, you can also understand the importance of research as a complement uh, to communications in order to get people to pay attention, change their attitudes, and ultimately demand safer and stronger building. It is much better to learn this lesson from the IBA's test chamber than from places like Moore, Oklahoma and Miami, Florida. Along with stronger, safer building, we believe that mitigation leads to a stronger, safer insurance system. Among the insurance-related benefits of mitigation are a reduction in the frequency and severity of weather-related claims, a downward shift in the loss exceedance curve, better management of losses in rare but severe events, more efficient capital deployment, healthier private insurance markets, and less stress on residual markets. The property insurance research industry's research priorities for wind mitigation are directly in line with policyholder interests. Less physical destruction, less economic loss, less societal displacement, fewer injuries and deaths. Breaking the cycle of destruction so that residential and commercial structures do not have to be put together again and again will benefit building owners, occupants, communities, and also insurers. In closing, I thank you for the opportunity to offer our comments on the critical role of mitigation research and the importance of NWERP reauthorization. We urge you to move forward on this important legislation that will help to harness advancements in windstorm science and engineering in order to improve our nation's safety, sustainability, and resilience. Thank you very much for your testimony. I now recognize our final witness, Dr. Previtt, for five minutes. Chairman Bouchon, Chairman Massey, and honorable subcommittee members, my name is David Previtt. I am here to advocate on behalf of the American people for the creation of a wind hazard resilient communities within the next 10 years. I believe the reason we don't have this already is that no one has been bold enough or committed enough to demand it. I wish to add the support of the American Society of Civil Engineers and the American Association for Wind Engineering and my own support for H.R. 1786. 
These organizations have been working for the past 10 years since Congressman Randy Nogaboa of Texas first proposed this legislation. We also support the transfer of leadership from the, to the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Since Professor Fujita first published his Fujita Scale in 1971 and his report on the Lubbock tornado, our populations in the tornado alley has grown 50%. What does that mean? We have more schools, we have more hospitals, commercial spaces, and certainly a lot more houses. It's not complicated. There are today more objects in harm's way than there were before. Also, since 1970s as well, NOAA and the National Severe Storms Laboratory has invested heavily in weather infrastructure, over $167 million over the last 10 years, in better research to predict unstable weather, in providing warnings of tornadoes, in more equipment, forecasting products. The public is aware of this and confident in its use. And private sector has stepped up to mine it. We can get uh, forecasting information on our smartphones. It's not complicated. Longer lead times before tornado strikes re reduce loss of life. In parallel, the 1970 Texas Tech University wind engineering faculty, they initiated the first building damage studies after the Lubbock tornado, documented problems with houses, how they are made. Modern houses still have those problems. Houses are, uh, have smaller nails, fewer nails, than they once were in the 1940s. Connections are inadequate. They cannot resist tornado loads. Houses are insufficiently anchored to the foundations and they rack very easily. There are no vertical load paths in the houses built in Tornado Alley, and I can attest I was there in Moore, Oklahoma two weeks ago. It's not complicated. The result is more houses, more poorly built houses, and more property loss and disruption of our communities. Tornadoes now, damage has increased two and a half times since the 1970 Lubbock tornado. So my message today is not complicated. It's simply to tell our representatives that the people of the United States want to live in tornado resilient communities. They also deserve to live there without fear. A tornado resilient community is one where all schools have shelters or at least safer spaces that afford some protection to our children. That our hospitals and emergency buildings are all hardened against tornadoes, wind hazards, and earthquakes that our houses are built so that fewer will be completely destroyed, destroying the lives, and some will be repairable after a tornado. Civil infrastructure are designed for tornadoes, and that the private sector has the research backing to work to economically develop affordable and weather resilient houses. Really, it's not complicated. The wind engineering and structural engineering communities stand ready to begin this work. We have been ready for 10 years. And with your support, we can begin this task to provide for our people. To get there, please support H.R. 1786, authorize its funding, and sustain support for the wind engineering and structural engineering communities for our houses. Let's mobilize communities leaders to upgrade their building codes and include a vertical load path provisions in all buildings, in all buildings. Support our research community to work with innovative private sector companies to design buildings and build resilient and sustainable 21st century houses. It can be done. Advance the wind and structural engineering research program support your faculty that will provide these solutions to these existing problems. Honorable members, it really isn't complicated. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank all the witnesses for your, for your testimony. It's a fascinating subject. 
I want to remind the members that the committee rules limit questioning to five minutes. The chair will at this point uh, open the round of questions. I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, uh, Ms. Ballin and Dr. Previtt initially, what is the what are the stepping stones that are preventing us from building better proper better homes? I mean, what are what are the what are the, what's the rate limiting steps? Why why even with all the information we have out there, why why don't we do it? Do you want to Doctor? Well, uh, we've actually uh, developed a strategic plan at IVHS that I think responds to your question, and that is first we need to get people to pay attention. Uh, we have the research capabilities. These fine universities work that groups like ours done provide the technical answers, but we need people to understand them. And the video that you saw I think is an example of getting people to pay attention. That video has actually been on the Today Show. It's been on the Weather Channel. People have seen that and begun to think about, gee, how do I make that not happen? So the next step is getting them to change their minds and getting them to value that stronger roof instead of a granite countertop. And once individuals are making those choices, we as a society need to rise up and really demand a demand to be in a community with a better building code or demand uh, you know, that the Congress you know, enacts these types of uh, legislation. I think a lot of people just don't, don't, they haven't gotten that first step, so they can't get to the second step and the third step. And that's at least our, you know, one perspective on that. Dr. Pravat? Uh, what I would add to that is we still lack the knowledge of designing buildings for tornadoes. The, there has been a dearth of research in wind engineering that supported the uh, faculty working on wind engineering matters. We had a, a, the zenith in the 1980s, and since that time, there just has not been the research there. Um, currently, we're trying to understand how the, the tornado loads interact on a particular building, how the load paths have to be improved in order to do that. So part of the problem is not only do people uh, need to be uh, initiated to want to change, we have to provide an opportunity and knowledge of how they can change. Thank you. I, I can tell you I was in healthcare before and there's a powerful uh, motivating factor for people and it's called denial. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it's a very difficult thing to overcome when people see a, what's the statistical chance of their f home being hit. Uh, and convincing them that they need to have that home built with higher standards. It's a very, very difficult thing to overcome, as well as messaging wh sure. why that is the case. Uh, Dr. Kiesling, uh, this is uh, uh, my own personal question. Is there been any, is there research out there on not only telling us where tornadoes are and where they're going, but how to divert them away from urban centers? I think the first part of that question is, the answer is yes, certainly the uh, people are doing an excellent job of predicting the path and and wh where the tornadoes are. Uh, I don't see any hope of diverting, though we occasionally hear from people who have proposals for that. In the first place, we don't know where they're going to occur far enough in advance. And secondly, there's a tremendous amount of energy there that has to be dealt with in trying to d divert them. So I... Uh, I frankly, personally, do not have much hope for that. Or dissipate them, for example, dissipate I, the energy or anything like I, that. I, hopefully it can work. Uh, I uh, have to depend upon, I guess, the next generation to come up with solutions there because I, I simply do not see how, how we can dissipate or divert tornadoes. Okay. Is there a difference, describe the difference in research between straight line winds and tornado, tornadic winds. Is there, is there a big difference there? Well, straight line winds generally, uh, we, we know what pressures they exert on buildings and uh, they're, they're pretty predictable, but in a tornado or a hurricane, the variations are, are great and I think we need to know a lot more about the, not only the intensity, but the variation and the characteristics of extreme winds so that we can better deal with them. And we're making progress, but again, it, it, it's a long, slow process and requires manpower that is hard to come by. You have a comment, Doctor? I would add that uh, in tornadoes as well, we have something that we don't understand, which is a, a vertical suction below this, the vortex. And that has never been, you know, uh, understood in terms of how it reacts or interacts with the, the winds that are in swinging into the, the tornado. 
Thank you very much. My time is about to expire, so I'll, I'll now uh, recognize Ms. Wilson for her line of questioning. Thank you. In her testimony, Ms. Ballon states that wind hazard research has been underfunded for decades. The other witnesses also express a similar sentiment in their testimonies. All of you indicate that NWARP has never been implemented in any meaningful way because of lack of resources. What opportunities are we missing by not providing the program with, as Dr. Kissling puts, a reliable, sustained source of funding for maturation and expansion? I think we just have to look at the earthquake engineering program and see what benefits we have gained from that. The, we're talking about something that has been funding to the level of, you know, millions of dollars per year. Literally all of the wind engineering research over the last 10 years in the top wind engineering schools amounts to about $1 million per year. We're talking about, and I have seen it, Joplin, Missouri, Tuscaloosa, and more Oklahoma. We're talking about two billion, three billion, and five billion. Those are the numbers, and we simply are not uh, addressing them. What has happened over the time, unfortunately, is there has been attrition of wind engineering faculty. Uh, structural engineering faculty no longer study the how to make houses stronger. They're on to, uh, you know, commercial structures and so on. And these are the areas where we have the most damage, the most dollars lost, and the most lives affected. Uh, I, I agree certainly uh, with everything uh, that Dr. Pravac just said. I, I think our feeling is that if there were more money that were in this program, or money in this program, since there really hasn't been money in this program, you know, we've identified in, in a broad way the areas where we think we could really lead to progress. Uh, and the first is enhanced understanding of the events themselves. And uh, different, different issues uh, in terms of understanding tornadoes and understanding hurricanes, but certainly it starts with the science uh, and the meteorology of that. Uh, the second is understanding the connections between those events and the built environment. We're doing some of that at the IBHS uh, Research Center, but certainly more could be done uh, through enhanced funding uh, through, through NWERP of, of universities and, and, and others. We recreate the nature, and then we see how nature reacts uh, to the built environment, homes and small businesses. Uh, the third area uh, is identifying those mitigation measures that actually work. A tornado proof uh, home or, or even in, in the area of hurricanes uh, where we know a lot more uh, there's still a lot more to be learned about how to make those structures better able to sustain um, uh, to sustain nature uh, and, and the final thing uh, would be making sure that the tests that our products and standards are based on really do accurately reflect the real world uh, what we saw in the um, auto safety arena uh, was that everyone could build a car that uh, withstood the first nits of tests because they knew exactly what they needed to build to and that didn't necessarily mean uh, it was safe in the real world and so we need to develop testing standards that actually do uh, reflect what we learned from the first side uh, in terms of uh, the real world weather events. As far as the funding levels uh, are concerned, uh, as you identified in, in your opening statement, um, you know, wh whatever the level is, and, and, and more is obviously better from the perspective, I think, of all of the panelists uh, that are here, but you also identified that the static funding is a problem. Uh, if the idea of the program is some of these are short, some of these are median, some of these are long-term events, uh, if you fund it sort of at the same level throughout the, the, the three-year period or whatever the period is, uh, you get everything started and then you can't identify anything new uh, in the second and third year. So we certainly would recommend at least modest upticks uh, as you go forward so that, you know, we can make sure that we can start what we finish, uh, but also start other things that are identified in the early years of the program. Dr. Kirsten, you have any response? Sorry, what was the question? Did you ask me if I needed to add anything? Do you want to add anything? Well, I, the lack I, of funding. I, I think, again, uh, not only the level of funding, but the continuity is a problem because, uh, particularly with young faculty, because young faculty ha are under tremendous pressure to uh, produce 
research, uh, to uh, generate funding, to publish, and if if they uh, have areas where that funding is is more readily available and dependable, then they're going to go to those areas. So it's very difficult for us to recruit young faculty into wind engineering, for example, because of the lack of our continuity of funding. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Mr. Schweikert for his questioning. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield to the sponsor of the bill, Mr. Nagabar. And, and I appreciate the uh, gentleman. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that uh, we uh, want to happen here, and, and it's been alluded to by, by the witnesses, is getting people to build uh, buildings that will uh, mitigate uh, some of the potential damage and, and loss of life. Uh, and I think one of the, th the, the misnomers out there is that you have to build Fort Knox uh, and so that, that the cost of a building that, you know, is not economic because of the, uh, the probability of that event uh, uh, happening versus the, the, the cost of doing it. Uh, and, and so one of the things I think I'm very uh, big on is, is uh, the, using the carrot, you know, record rather than the stick. And so one of the, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one of those, do you see within, for example, uh, well, many of these, these losses of property were insured losses. And, and so obviously the, the insurance industry has a huge interest in, you know, in, in this issue. Uh, two things, do you see them uh, recognizing a difference uh, in homes or buildings built uh, to different standards uh, so that there is incentive for homeowners or, or, or people that are building a building to, you know, to spend the extra uh, dollars to do that? So that would be my, my first question. Uh let me take that one since I, I know a little bit about uh, that issue. Um, we look at uh, property mitigation in, in two ways. One are building codes uh, and one are efforts to go above building codes. Building codes, as much as we support them, are really intended for life safety uh, as opposed to property protection. And so uh, while obviously a code-built home is better in many ways, um, if the issue is property protection, uh, I think that's not necessarily what an individual insurer is likely uh, to consider the best possible. Uh, IBHS has developed a voluntary standard. It's called Fortified Home or Fortified for Safer Living and does go above code. It's, it's hazard specific. Uh, so we try to identify um, the types of building construction techniques that will help uh, for, for, for specific hazards. Um, Again, every insurance company does make its own decisions, but several states have recognized Fortified uh, and re requiring uh, insurance companies to do that in their filings. So we do have a little bit of a track record uh, in Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, South Carolina, and we are seeing that companies are, in fact, individually making decisions uh, in terms of uh, filing. Uh, that said, I, I want to emphasize that the types of things that are in Fortified are not unaffordable. Uh, they're relatively low-cost improvements that a homeowner can make, uh, talking about a couple of thousand dollars generally, particularly in an area that already has a code. Uh, one of our partners uh, in terms of Fortify for Safer Building is Habitat for Humanity. Uh, they are actually the, the largest builder in this country uh, at this point in time. Uh, and we have partnered with Habitat on a number of fortified homes uh, in hurricane-prone areas and in other areas. And so if we can get those fortified standards into a Habitat home, you know that those are not unaffordable uh, standards. It's a question of sort of being there at the time when decisions are being made. You know, to say to someone that has a roof on a home, this is not a good roof, you need to take this roof off and put a whole nother roof on, it is a very expensive proposition. Uh, but if you are at the point where a homeowner is replacing a roof or, or needs to replace a roof because the first roof has blown off, uh, it doesn't cost that much more to build to a fortified standard. And, and so I, I think one of the things that, another theme uh, of, of this particular legislation, but I think a theme that, that you hear a number of, uh, of the people uh, up here talked about is, you know, dissemination of that information and coordination of that information. And so, uh, uh, for example, uh, when you, this research, for example, do you sit down with, say, say uh, industry participants to say the National Home Builders, for example, uh, and share, uh, you know, th this, this information and, and, and introduce a, a dialogue with them to uh, make sure that they, they uh, uh, are, are, are being made aware of this? We, we certainly have started that. Um, they started out uh, rather negative and skeptical. 
uh, of IBHS and our capabilities and our mitigation messages, but we've invited them all to our research center. Uh, they see that $40 million facility, they see that fan capability, and they realize that we are very serious about doing the research and doing the communications, and, and that has led to a much more constructive dialogue. Uh, there are a number of organizations that we have had long-standing, very positive relationships with, and I should, should mention the ASE is probably um, one of our strongest partners uh, here in Washington and at the state level, uh, and certainly at the technical level as well, they have visited our research center. Uh, the architects uh, are another group that we're trying to encourage young architects and architectural schools to uh, incorporate stronger building uh, into their curricula. So we are reaching out to a number of uh, organizations. Our, our companies reach out to their policyholders. We try to leverage those relationships to try to get the word out uh, and the social media, uh, which of course is huge in all areas and is huge after disasters. We're trying to make that part of the mitigation movement as well. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. I now recognize Ms. Johnson for her line of questioning. Five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, just as a follow-up to the course of questioning, I can't uh, forget the image of seeing the one lone house that remained standing during Hurricane Ike in Galveston, only to think, how did it survive all out there alone? to find later that the entire neighborhood was devastated and that house survived. And it was because they had used the type of materials that would resist uh, many winds. How do we, uh, I just heard your uh, comments for, uh, from the standpoint of encouraging architects and all, but it seems to me that local ordinances uh, when permission is gotten for building has to be involved. How do we do that without making it seem that this is big government trying to boss everybody? But I should think that insurance companies should be very interested in having resilience uh, in the building, as well as governments. We've, you know, with, with the um, ability of our satellite system to predict uh, We've done, we've gone a long ways in saving lives, but we haven't done nearly as well in saving property. And, and that is a major concern in an economy like today. Uh, how do you see that responsibility fitting where, and what can we do? Okay. Uh, Represent Johnson, one thing I would tell you about that one building that you saw in Ike. I saw one building or one neighborhood in Moore, Oklahoma that had hurricane ties, something that actually would hold the roof down to the wall. Just one out of thousands and thousands that we looked at. Essentially, we have to do a, an, a better argument to convince individuals, as Ms. Balin said, that this is something that they ought to think about instead of that granite countertop. Um, Let's look back uh, at ourselves a uh, hundred years ago. Our large cities, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, we all faced uh, a fire uh, considerations. Blocks and blocks were burning down. It was at that time that those city leaders, legislators, politicians, and the public got together and said, enough is enough. If Chicago is gonna survive, we're gonna have to you know, all pull in one direction, and that's what we did. Um, and we can do it again. We have the ability to do it again. I think right now uh, the public is generally fearful of tornadoes, fearful of the wind hazard, and they believe we don't have the talent to do it. I think we've put a man on the moon. We could pr pretty much keep a roof on a house. Thank you. I certainly agree with that statement. Uh, we are strong, very strong supporters uh, of building codes. And about a year ago, uh, we did a little study. Uh, we called it Rating the States. And we looked at the building code regimes from Texas uh, to, uh, to Maine in, in the hurricane prone, the coastal states uh, on a, one to 100, a zero to 100 scale. Uh, the scores uh, ranged from four uh, to 95. Uh, so there was quite a range. And I will tell you uh, that as a public communications vehicle, a lot of people may not know what a building code is, 
but they know that it's good to have a high score and it's bad to have a low score. And that really has started a dialogue. And the most positive responses that we've gotten from the media certainly have been in those states with the low, uh, the low scores about, about how they can do better. Um, one state that, that was not at the bottom was in the middle, but actually passed a bill last year, uh, this year, Maryland, uh, that specifically addressed an issue that we had identified in those, those states. So uh, it's a way of making building codes understandable to people. So again, they begin to demand uh, that they want to be, uh, we would say, ideally in a state. We support statewide mandatory building codes. It's much easier for enforcement. It's much more consistent. Uh, but there are some states where that hasn't happened, and Texas certainly is one of them. Uh, at a minimum, at the local level, there ought to be strong ordinances in effect. Any other witness comment? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize Mr. Lipinski for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, now in his testimony, Dr. Kiesling uh, calls for economic, social, and behavioral studies to understand the implementation of research results uh, like stronger building codes. Um, I think this is something uh, very important that we have to um, imp we have to uh, use the lessons from. Uh, social science to ensure that the uh, other lessons that we are learning from research get uh, implemented. Can uh, Dr. Kiesling and other uh, witnesses expand upon, upon that and where exactly they, they see the, the importance? Well, I think implementation is a, a serious problem in all, all many areas. Uh, I, I would back up a little bit and say that in terms of improved building codes, we, we can do a lot of good by simply meeting a di existing building codes. They're not, uh, say, effectively enforced or inspected. Uh, but if we increased the design wind load only a small amount, we would save a lot of property because I even in a tornado, most of the damage is done at wind speed, say, in the 100 to 125 mile per hour wind. Uh, and if we design for a little bit more than we do, uh, 90 or 100 mile per hour winds, that would save a lot of the structures that are currently being destroyed. I don't know what the answers are to implementation, but I see it as a serious, serious problem, uh, not only in enforcing building codes, but it, it haunts me that I hear reports of traffic deaths in our city and in many instances, it, people were killed in rollover accidents without wearing their seat belts. So they're sitting on property they already own uh, that, that can be very effective in saving lives. And, and so it should not surprise us, I think, that we have problems in enforcing building codes and motivating people to do a better job of construction. I don't know the answers, but I, I think we need to involve maybe social sciences and disciplines that we have not uh, effectively engaged before to see how do we implement uh, what we already know. But there's much more to be learned. I don't say we know have all the answers. We need to learn much more, but we also need to do a better job of using what we already have. We are um, hoping actually to gather social scientists at our research center this December. Uh, so that we can really begin to explore that in more detail. Uh, to the extent we've sort of sketched out the way we think about this issue, uh, we think it's first a question of sort of getting the hearts and minds of people, uh, getting them to really sort of want this, and we talked about that a little bit before uh, uh, in, in terms of one of the answers to the previous questions. The second is providing the adequate incentives. Uh, that's for both individuals uh, and for states, uh, an example. Uh, of how that might work at the state level is the state building, uh, the state uh, building code incentive act uh, that also has been introduced in this Congress uh, provides additional funding for states that do the right thing in terms of enacting strong building codes. That's a financial incentive. Uh, there can be other incentives for individuals. Uh, and finally, understanding the politics of this. We talked about the builders. You know, we have to make this a win-win proposition uh, and make the market really want this to happen uh, for us to sort of address those social science issues. 
I might add that uh, NOAA and the NSF, National Science Foundation, last year, they operated or they organized a, a pretty uh, comprehensive workshop called Weather Ready Nation, in which they brought together the physical scientists and engineers with the social scientists to actually discuss the, the issues of weather, um, the, you know, acknowledging that yes, forecasting has got us so far, and yes, we are better at it, but the property damage. So the, the move has been started. There is a, a report which, if you would like, I can provide that link to you, um, in which we are now working with social scientists. I was on a rapid NSF project in Moore, Oklahoma, and we did involve uh, Mississippi State uh, social scientists and social scientists from the University of Alabama, as well as ourselves engineers in uh, other universities. Thank you, yeah, I'd like to uh, take a look at that. I, I think it's something that we oftentimes overlook, I think, in legislation here. Uh, we should make sure in end work that uh, we include the social sciences because you can do all the research that you want to uh, know how to mitigate uh, damage to property, uh, threats to, uh, to human life if no one is implementing those. And we don't know, as Ms. Balance said, uh, we're not sure about the incentives um, of how to get people to uh, actually take that into account then uh, we just have research sitting on a shelf that's not doing anyone uh, any good. So I think that's something important that we have to uh, have to make sure that we are considering here in um, you know, providing at the federal level. Uh, I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now recognize Ms. Esty for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As a quick follow-up to this, Mr. Lipinski's discussion, for Ms. Balin, in looking at incentives, is the insurance industry offering lower premiums to those who have retrofitted or, say, hurricane ties? I mean, what sort of incentives is the marketplace providing? Because we know, for example, the tax credits do not seem to be terribly effective right now. Um, so I'm wondering what's being done on the private side. I always do stress that individual companies make their own decisions. But that said, um, IBHS developed a Code Plus technical standard called Fortified. Uh, we know that those technical standards work, and the, the program includes a, a, an inspection and designation process so that we know that the homes that were built to those standards, supposedly built to those standards, really are built to those standards. Many individual companies are providing discounts for fortified homes, uh, and that's also been required in rate filings in some states. But it's not enough to say, oh, uh, if a homeowner says or a builder says that they've built to that standard, it is. It's got to be inspected. It's got to be verified. Uh, thank you. And I, a further follow-up, living in Connecticut, where we experienced a number of storms over the last few years, we have great concern about resilience, about the lifelines, utilities, infrastructure. So if any of the three of you can talk a little bit about what is being done on the research side on these critical issues that where you can't have rebuilding, you can't have, uh, you can't even get access to people, you can't get them back online, and what we ought to be looking at in that department. I think that is uh, the entire uh, direction of the Engineering School of Sustainable Infrastructure and, and, and Environment at the University of Florida. That's our entire mission. Um, it is in, in several uh, u universities, uh, resilience and sustainability are the, the hallmarks of what we're doing in civil engineering. Um, before we be get to a sustainable uh, society, we first of all have to get a resilient one, a one that is more robust and that it the research uh, sometimes is fundamental to this. It, we do need to better understand the loads. We do need to better understand the structural uh, properties of the, the buildings, the infrastructure, the utilities, what have you. But, you know, I, th I think we really just need to decide. We really do need just to decide that we want to live in a sustainable society and we can do it. Um, we Yes, it'll cost some money, it'll cost some time, and we, but. I guarantee you, if you put engineers and scientists, social scientists as well, on this case, we can do this in 10 years. It, it, it takes a, you know, just that bold vision to, to go after it. 
Well, I know some of the work, say, that Francis Karen Cross has done looking at multiple ways to address climate change issues, and particularly with our populations being increasingly concentrated on the coasts, we are seeing whatever it's attributable attributable to, we are certainly seeing an increase in more severe weather. So I think it is going to be extremely important that we take this resilience uh, line of research quite seriously and address it as an extremely high priority um, as we are extremely energy dependent for everything that we do. If we do not harden our systems, we've been looking at cybersecurity, but we also just need to look at natural weather ability to bring down whole cities, and I'm quite concerned that we not forget how critical that is. Just look what happened in Staten Island, look what happened in New York. And we do need to be emphasizing retrofitting, not just new standards, but what are we going to do with major cities that need to be retrofitted for the utility side? Thanks very much. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. I now ask unanimous consent to recognize a member of the full committee for questioning. There's no objection. Then the chair now recognizes Mr. Nagabauer for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Truman. I'd also like to return the favor and uh, yield a little of my time to uh, Mr. Swackert from Arizona. Oh, thank you. I didn't know if I should object there, and if I would put <laughs> me back in, and then I could yield. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, is uh, it's Ms. Ballin? Ballin. Ballin. Um, actually, Elizabeth actually was hitting um, the a point that I wanted to go to. We all live in a world where how many of us right now will go out and buy a Volvo over, is it a Corvair? Any of us are old enough to remember a yep. Corvair, you know, unsafe at any speed. But the fact of the matter, when you're buying a car today, are we also looking at the consumer reports and saying, hey, this is safe, my insurance is cheaper? There is a price differential there driven by the insurance industry that actually changes our purchasing behavior. Why isn't that also the decision? for those of us in purchasing residential real estate is our price differential and our cost of insurance? That's an excellent question and one we ask ourselves every single day. Uh, uh, our peer organization uh, is the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety and they showed the way how research and communications lead to uh, safer cars and people wanting them and then you have enough people with these cars that you really begin to see the difference in the losses uh, and insurance companies respond to that. Well, but, 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 but you know, I, I understand, you know, for public buildings and schools and, and those things, particularly those with some federal resources in them, we have a voice there. But if I'm out buying a residential property or getting ready to refit or remodel and I, I how, how many of us have bought a house and we will fixate on small margins on the interest rate between one lender and another? Um, but if there's actual price differentials understood in the market between I did these types of tie downs on my roof and this house doesn't have these sorts of tie downs, so I'm going to pay this sort of premium. Isn't that the ultimate solution here? That, that is the ultimate solution. The market is the ultimate solution. It would be uh, benefited by the kind of research that we're talking about, uh, but ultimately people need to want that. Now, I think that the impediments well, well, the world are, works on incentives and disincentives, so it's, they want it, they just need to understand they need to there's understand a price it, difference. Yes, and, and um, the building industry is much more complicated than the automobile industry. There are thousands of builders out there versus, uh, you know, five or six or seven uh, car companies. Uh, the the uh, the guys that do it are, are every every roofer. You well, know. Well, well, in, in, and only because um, my undergrad is in real estate and my master's focuses on finance. You know, the, the real estate world is the life I grew up in. It's not the builders. It's the consumer. And if you told me, if I came to you right now and said, hey, you buy this house because of the way attributes you pay this interest rate, but if I bought this one, I pay this interest rate, we'd all scream and go running to this one. Why is it not the same in interest or in insurance? And um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield to Mr. Nagabar because I know he had a little bit more on this. Okay. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Kiesling, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that you mentioned a while ago is that. Uh, the winds of a tornado are much different than than than, than you know just a, a, a gust a, a vertical um, wind. So, and, and there's different categories of of, of events uh, all the way from I guess an F zero to F five, and and uh, so there's probably in this particular point in time 
the F five is just we don't have the technology, you know, to to uh, on an economic basis to protect a home from an F five storm, probably. So, so then then we if we go just to to then to the the mitigation of life over property, saying that the house doesn't make it. But there are things that you've you've done and worked on that, that uh, uh, various degrees that are fairly affordable inside that home of fortification. Could you just kind of cover a little bit of, of of what are some some practical things that that could be done in in uh, in the in the homes both retrofit and in new construction? Well, thank you for asking. I think for early on, we more or less adopted the approach that uh, it's very expensive to take a uh, home of the type that we build today and design it to, to resist the worst case tornado. Uh, you can certainly improve the performance and protect against severe damage from the vast majority of even tornadoes because, the, the, as I've said before, the damage is caused by marginal wind speeds. But we uh, adopted the idea or the philosophy of, of providing occupant protection in a small room, now called a safe room, uh, because it's, it's very affordable to harden and stiffen a small room uh, of, the, of the house to provide near absolute occupant protection. That might be a closet, a pantry, a bathroom, and that's practical for new construction, but the vast majority of safe rooms being installed today are manufactured. They're steel boxes, concrete boxes, timber boxes uh, installed in the garage on the slab of the garage, and they're very affordable. There are even those shelters that are uh, mounted under the slab. You can go in the garage, cut out a section of the uh, piece of the garage floor, excavate, put a shelter under there, and put a sliding door on it so you provide protection without even losing a parking space. There are many, many options available today, and, and I would say for almost every situation, a circumstance, it's possible to design occupant protection from the worst case tornado. And we have a real problem with that right now with public perception, because there was so much bad publicity, misinformation in Oklahoma uh, about uh, having to be underground to survive an EF-5. That is simply a falsehood that should should be squelched. Uh, but in answer to your question, I think there is a, a, a way to protect life in a, in a safe room very inexpensively, and I think we must do the best we can in reducing the damage by improving the buildings through building code, building codes enforcement. Uh, one other point that I would make that's different in, in the automobile industry and, and in the uh, uh, home building industry. Both are sensitive to initial cost, but most of the houses are built speculative today. And as you well know, the uh, marketability of housing is very, very sensitive to the initial cost. And not only builders, but I think homeowners too, look at that initial cost and tend to resist any improvement that cost very much initially. Thank you very much. Uh, I like At this point, I'd like to thank the witnesses for their, their testimony and the members for their questions. Uh, the members of the committee may have additional questions for you, and we will ask that you respond to those in writing. Uh, the record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments and written questions from the members. At this point, the witnesses are excused. The hearing is adjourned.